We're now working on the AMI Model K jukebox. And what I'm going to talk about is the pulse converter system. This system, I think, is one of the most complex uh, data encoding systems that you'll find in a mechanical jukebox. And it has really taken a lot of uh, learning, experimentation, and effort to uh, kind of figure out how it works. And I, com I haven't got it completely working yet, but that's the goal. I've got a lot of, I've got it almost there, but it's still not, it's still not completely working right. But I fixed a whole lot of problems in it, so eventually we will get it working like it should. But I want to talk about how it works to maybe help uh, to help you on the learning curve with this uh, if you've worked with one of these because. We got this jukebox. It belongs to Retro Electronics. We got this um, years ago, and I just cleaned the contacts and got it to work. But then the performance kept degrading, and it kept not picking up selections, not writing in selections correctly. So I decided uh, it was time to really learn about how this system works, not just kind of spray the contacts and hope that it's going to work. Now I really needed to learn about it, just like the. Uh, upper intake manifold. I'm, what I'm trying to do is to is to always improve my learning and knowledge about these devices to help me uh, fix more complex problems than I've uh, ever done before. So I'm going to talk about the pulse converter and what it is is a system of serial data transmission between this keyboard here and the uh, jukebox selection system. The way that the jukebox uh, determines uh, what selection to play is through the memory pins back here. The memory pins get uh, pushed, pushed in when a selection is made, but then there has to be a way of determining which pin to, to push to correlate to the selection you want. And this gear here, you can sort of see it goes, you can sort of see it turn, I don't know if you can see it through the back, it turns a, uh, a mechanism which has two arms on it to push in selection pins. And the uh, position of this determines what gets pushed. So there has to be a way to, to stop the mechanism, to rotate it and stop it at the correct point. And that's done by these, by these mechanisms here. And I'm going to take the pulse converter out and talk about it a little bit more in detail, um, but I wanted to first show how it works in the jukebox. So this has to turn around in order to find selections. You've got two circuit boards here. This is for setting up the, no the uh, letter contact, and this is for setting up the number. And there's a gear, uh, a gear reduction on this, so you, this one, you can see, turns a lot faster here. That one there is the number contacts. And it's got a toothed wheel on it, which is called the Sprag wheel. And this is the, uh, the Sprag solenoid here. And when the solenoid is activated, that little tooth goes down in there and locks this so that the, uh, the write-in solenoid can push out those arms and make contact with the appropriate pin to set it. But uh, what has to happen is the uh, this and so in order to do that, this solenoid here has to turn on at the appropriate time, and that's determined by these little contacts here. There's several groups of contacts: one, uh, two on this wheel, and two on the other and they line up with some contacts on the printed circuit boards and whenever they line up at the appropriate place a circuit is completed through all those contacts current goes to the Sprag relay and it locks it in place and so when you get to that point you gotta say well what circuit on the little circuit boards do you want to enable and in order to do that the, uh, the steppers come into play here. Now on the AMI Continental that we worked on, it had these circuit boards, but it didn't have the steppers. It used a parallel means of data transmission between the keyboard and the selection circuit boards. You can see here that there are little 
little traces here. It's a double-sided circuit board. And for instance, on the Continental, each one of these little traces was connected to a key on the keyboard so that that's uh, when a circuit was completed like through J12 the J contact would be enabled here and the 12 contact would be here this this uh, A through K correlates to contacts 1 through 10 you can see here and then over here you got contacts 1 through 20 for the numbers 1 through 20 but uh, in order to simplify, and the reason a serial system was used here was, I think, to communicate with wall boxes. Because with the serial system, you don't need to have an individual wire for each contact. You can encode the data with pulses, just like in a computer system. With a parallel uh, cable, data flows through several conductors, like 25 conductors to a printer, for instance, but with serial, it uh, just flows through one one pulse at a time. And I I don't I I know a little bit about serial data and computers, but not a whole lot. So don't <laughs> don't hold me to any technicalities on that. But I do know that that uh, with serial data has to has to kind of line up and and come through like one pulse at a time and the way it does here is by two pulse trains. One pulse train is for the letter data, and that activates this stepper here. And the second pulse train, after a pause, is for the number data, and that activates this stepper here. And I'm going to do a, a series of videos on this. I'm going to then explain about the different relays uh, in the pulse receiver here, or the pulse converter, and what they do uh, in, as far as decoding that data. Because this is really like an analog to, or a digital to analog conversion system. Digital data from the keyboard is encoded serially, travels to the pulse converter, the pulse steppers convert that serial data into parallel data and provide the contact paths through the, uh, the circuit boards. And then the selection wheel stops at a certain point and so that digital data is converted to a, uh, an analog position of the selection wheel so the appropriate memory pin can be pushed. So you've, in effect, got two different data write-in cycles. You've got to write in the proper data in, into the pulse converter to get it set up to write in the proper data into the memory bank of the jukebox so that then the carousel can scan and stop at that pin to play the desired record. And this system is just, I really think it's more complex than it needs to be. Every other jukebox had an add-on stepper that had this serial to parallel decoding scheme if wall boxes were used and inside the jukebox itself it was a more robust parallel setup. You didn't have to rely on the steppers just to operate the jukebox itself. But this one they decided to integrate the steppers into the selection mechanism and this, I think that this actually did come in one that had a parallel setup between the keyboard and the contacts and didn't have the steppers. And there was another section that was a completely manual interface. You just turned a little wheel here and you just pressed a button to write in the selection. And so the uh, write in, the finding of the selection to write in was completely analog and manual. But, um, kind of getting long in this video, so uh, I'll make another one later talking more about how the pulse converter works, but let me just demonstrate. What you're going to see is these contacts here are going to move down a certain amount based on the uh, letter, and these contacts here are going to move down a certain amount based on the number. So what I'm going to do, I'm going to do A1. So it's, or it's going to move down one on the letter and one on the number. So first I'll demonstrate the letter right in and then the number. Well, I need to turn 
need to turn the switch to run here to get it to work. So here's the letter right in. See, it's on the first thing. And, and the sprag wheel is engaged, the sprag solenoid is engaging, but it's not going down the whole way. That's the problem I'm still dealing with. But I'm going to write in A1 again, and now look at the number contacts. They're going to move down one click, too. You see, it's trying to find it. It's, it's picking up. It's, it's trying to get it, but it still hasn't quite got it yet. Let's see if it... Maybe, a, maybe need to align the contacts a little better. Now let's try, and well, what I'll do is, as you can see, both of the steppers now. Go ahead and do A1. See, it found it, but there's still something I need to adjust in order to get that solenoid to complete the cycle. So now let's try, for instance, K20. So K20 is going to be 10 pulses on the letter stepper. 20 pulses on the number stepper. So here's K20. And uh, this is a real improvement over what it was doing because it was what it was doing was just rotating around and around and around, never finding the uh, never finding the the data on there because the contacts are all bent, the circuit boards are extremely tarnished. So this concludes the introduction to the pulse converter system. I'm going to take the pulse unit off of the jukebox and talk more in detail about the different components of it. Luckily it's very easily detached from the jukebox. There's two Allen screws here, just here, and I didn't put the other one back in. You remove the Allen screws, and then you can just, and then this hangs on a little, a little hook. You take it off, and there's a, uh, there's just a coupling that couples it, couples mechanical energy from this wheel back to there. There's no, and it just sort of fits in there. It's just a little crank that fits into a crank arm, so it's very easy to detach. So in the next uh, video about the pulse converter, we'll talk more in detail about its operation and some of the contact repairs I had to do to it.